if you haven't heard of Pedram, uh, you should, you probably have utilized a, a tool that he's written or been involved in something like a vulnerability disclosure program. But he's currently the CTO at Inquest. He previously is at a number of startups and currently lives in Austin, Texas. He is one of the founding members of iDefense Labs from way back and then it got acquired, I think by, it was um, a VeriSign first and then Accenture after that. But he's, he's one of the founding members of that and then went on to start up the Zero Day Initiative back early on under tipping points. So ZDI and iDefense both started by Pedram. So one of the early on pioneers of the whole world of um, vulnerability contributor programs and making sure that people get paid for that. You know, thousands of researchers submitting bugs which end up getting disclosed to Microsoft and other organizations as they're affected. So when I think of like one of the people who started up the whole world of getting paid for your security research and bug bounties, I think of Pedram. He's spoken at Black Hat, DEF CON, ShmooCon, I think Echo Party, many different conferences out there. He's taught courses on uh, reverse engineering. He's a huge contributor to the security community. He wrote the Sully fuzzing framework, which we still actually use a bit in 660, which of course is a fork version, which is boo fuzz, but Sully was Pedram's work. Um, also, the uh, Pi May and Pi Debug, if you've used those reverse engineering frameworks, he's the, the author of those. We've got um, just so many more tools, but his talk is titled Identifying Novel Malware at Scale. When I first glanced at it, I'm like, Novel Malware. Like, oh, no, no, not Novel Malware, Novel Malware. So um, with, with that being said, I know we're a couple minutes early, but I'm sure he's got a lot to say. So let me introduce Pedram Amini. Thank you, Stephen, uh, very much for that. How is um, audio, video quality all good? Yep, it's great. Great. Really appreciate the introduction. Uh, you've got me blushing. Uh, very, very kind of you. I'm um, happy to get started. Let me see if we've got mouse control. There we go. So Steve gave a great introduction, um, you know, really covered my entire uh, background, you know, predominantly historically, I've been very interested in, you know, the, the minutia of, of uh, deep like vulnerability development, um, exploitation. And, and today I find myself, uh, you know, more focused on large scale. So, you know, dealing with uh, millions upon millions of samples a day, how do you determine which ones of those samples are the ones that you should be focusing your efforts on? And that's really the subject matter of this talk, is kind of walking through uh, large scale data sets and talking about you know, what's working for attackers, what's working for uh, defenders, and you know, what we do uh, internally, at least at Inquest, for you know, managing this problem with, uh, with scale. <clears throat> So, you know, one of my unfair advantages, as I like to call it, is, you know, I, I've gotten to work with thousands of researchers globally. I've seen countless zero day in my time at uh, iDefense's VCP and uh, since starting the, you know, tipping points as zero day initiative. But although there are some really beautiful exploits out there, you know, you look at like works of truly like art, like uh, things like Stuxnet or, uh, you know, some of these jailbreaks or, you know, thinking back to like uh, Pinkie Pie's, you know, like 18 chained uh, vulnerabilities uh, to get, uh, you know, to pop a shell on Chrome. There's a lot of beautiful exploits out there, but if you look at what's actually working for attackers, like, you know, what is resulting in folks getting owned, it's really quite simple stuff. It's low hanging fruit. You know, it's your invoice scams. It's your uh, uh, phishing attempts, right? It's open uh, S3 buckets and open elastic databases. Um, and the last one is, is carrier lures, right? And so carrier lures are a just generic term for, you know, all your client side application, uh, like document type providers. So like your Microsoft Office documents and spreadsheets, your Adobe PDF files, uh, you know, things like um, even like scripts and archives, Java applets, Flash applets, which, you know, to a large degree, Flash is uh, dead today. Uh, but most of the browsers are blocking it, but the subsystem is still... Uh, alive and well and reachable for, for many folks. And you don't have to look back too far. Uh, you know, in 2018, there was a zero day found in the wild um, attribution wise that was credited towards uh, uh, the North Koreans launching it uh, towards the South Korea. So carrier lures is the part that uh, we focus a lot of attention on and where I'm going to be focusing this talk. 
So, you know, let's look at it as, you know, from attacker's perspective, what's a formula for success? You know, if we were going to, to turn around tomorrow and start our own malware campaign operation, you know, it starts with, you know, if we're looking at it from the carrier perspective, you know, we're going to construct some novel carrier. Uh, and the exploit is optional. You know, it does not have to exploit some uh, zero day or some uh, end day. You know, we can very uh, happily embed some logic like a macro into a document and email it out to a number of uh, you know, potential targets. And somewhere, one of those users are going to open up our attachment and we're going to get a foothold onto their system that we can then start pivoting from there. You know, once we've gotten a, a novel carri carrier, we're going to want to do some testing on it, right? So you'll throw it up against a virus total, or if you've got some uh, private instance where you've installed a bunch of uh, AV technologies, you, know, you want to ensure that your carrier is going to be stealthy enough that it's going to, uh, by, be the, between the time of releasing your campaign and when it's actually going to be caught and defended against, you're going to harvest a good amount of, of targets. You know, the next step is, you know, either you need to own by purchasing or, or uh, you need to pwn by taking over, um, or you can utilize some shared infrastructure like your GitHubs and paste bins and you know, slacks. And I've even seen uh, uh, some command and control and pivot activity happen on Twitter. Uh, once you've gotten all this stuff put together, you seed your campaign via some spam and you know, now it's profit for uh, the attacker. And you know, we don't have to look very far to see the success of this, right? These columns are the top 10 most exploited um, uh, CVEs uh, per year. They're in uh, uh, alphanumeric lexicographical order, so not in the order of popularity. Uh, the legend across the bottom, so you'll see you know, Flash, PDF, Android, Java, IE, Office, and Windows. And you know, 2018 to 2020 comes from uh, Recorded Future. Uh, that 2019 table comes from US CERT. You know, look at that, it's almost entirely uh, Office or Office related, OLE related even at that. Uh, that flash vulnerability, that zero day that I talked about from 2018, there it is highlighted in red. So this um, 2018-4878. The bolded ones here are the ones that are the most common. So this uh, 2017 CVEs 0199 and 11882. The reds are zero days that were found uh, in, in the wild. So these are cases where uh, defenders saw this being exploited in the wild and they in turn you know, reacted to it building defenses, creating patches and whatnot. What's really interesting, and this is the subject matter of uh, my Black Hat talk last year called Worm Charming, um, is in all of these cases, you had between a week and two weeks of lead time prior to the campaign really taking off where those samples and that zero day was sitting in virus total. Um, there's another uh, group of guys from uh, uh, Eurocom and Symantec that did a, a talk called uh, Finding Needles in Haystacks that's more related to, to portable executable um, uh, uh, you know, malware discovery. You know, and I mentioned, you know, no exploit is required. So outside of all those CVEs being the, the, the top exploited per year, um, you know, almost all of them falling on, uh, on the Windows desktop side of the uh, spectrum. Um, you know, here's one that's eating everybody's lunch at the moment. You know, it's, a, it's an old, old technology. This is a Microsoft Excel macro sheets were introduced in 1992. Right, and this uh, technique, we found it somewhere in January of last year, uh, you know, initial iteration of it where folks are embedding this old version of Excel macro sheets. It's a different way of getting embedded logic into a, a spreadsheet carrier. And over time, it just started picking up in popularity. You know, today, uh, you know, we're actively tracking this as being the most, uh, you know, commonly stealthy and bypassing a, a tactic. And it's completely, you know, exploit free. Um, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, Amir, uh, known as Dissect Malware on Twitter, he wrote this tool called uh, this tool called the XLM Macro Deobfuscator. It's free and open source. Uh, I would highly recommend that in terms of uh, um, using it for for dissection purposes. Uh, I'll, I'll drop these links to the blogs for any kind of samples if folks are interested in it. And we have a series of Yara rules as well that can help you in your either threat hunting or defensive operations. If you're interested in more specifics on Maldox, um, I would recommend uh, Didier Stevens' talk from uh, yesterday. You know, he, uh, Didier is really well known. Uh, I have a lot of admiration for the work he does. You know, I use his tooling uh, daily. Um, he wrote tools like uh, OLE Dump for walking the structured format of these pre-2007 um, compound document format files. 
And in his talk, he, he jumps into a bunch of more specifics on um, the payloads and getting them uh, you know, past defensive mechanisms. He also disclosed a couple of, uh, of new ways uh, of, or of new tactics, the most interesting of which is a code signing tampering bug. Um, you know, not to, to just real synopsis. In essence, there's two types of code uh, in uh, your, your, your embedded VBA. And the one that's signed, uh, you can modify the compiled version of the P-code version of it and essentially bypass the signature check. Really, really neat uh, tech. You know, for sure, you're going to see this uh, uh, being exploited by attackers in the not so distant future. You know, so you know, zooming out and looking at a common malware campaign, kind of like a visualization of, uh, you know, what we covered in the beginning, you know, the, the three steps for an attacker to profit. You know, what it looks like when it comes to your users is typically it's going to be delivered um, over email, whether it's an, an attachment or a, a URL, you know, phishing, whatever it is, something like 90-something percent of, of uh, attacks are email-born. Um, it doesn't matter who you ask, they all have some number that's over 90%. Over so that's the initial uh, opportunity, the initial in interaction with these malware campaigns. You know, from there, typically most malware is multi-stage. You know, whether it's pivoting through some living off the land technique, uh, you know, PowerShell and Windows, maybe like a Python and a Mac OS. You know, typically there's multiple layers to uh, a successful um, exploited you know, system. Um, maybe it'll make an HTTP request to, for example, a compromised WordPress site. You know, this is something that we'll see fairly commonly. You'll see malware hosted in some random restaurant in Greece because uh, unfortunately that guy was running an old version of WordPress and uh, you know, some spray and pray uh, uh, campaign guy went and picked that up and added it to his list of infrastructure uh, for places to, to host his second stage payloads. You know, the benefit of this, of course, is he didn't have to stand up the infrastructure. So tracking wise, um, if you're doing actor tracking, you might not be able to catch this new uh, know that he popped. Um, and also it's got good reputation. You know, that you know, poor restaurant in Greece, for example, has been around for years. It's a legitimate website. Um, and so he's piggybacking off of that, that rep. You know, another option, of course, is to communicate with your own stood up malicious servers. Uh, more commonly, folks are using US-based IP addresses, standing up uh, temporary services and, and so hosting providers like Amazon, um, just as one example. You know, and finally, you've got your, your final like payload delivery. So when we're looking at, um, <clears throat> when we're looking at, the, at the malware campaign from a defender's perspective, you know, there's a number of different places here that we can, we can provide defense. We could, at step one, maybe block that email. You know, at step two, perhaps we can detect the traffic pattern or detect the, uh, the URL uh, uh, structure of that compromised website. You know, maybe we can, uh, at step three, we can identify the attacker's infrastructure. You know, we're tracking IPs, domains, these are pretty standard IOCs. Uh, and more popularly, you know, we're tracking SSL certificates. So you can look at like your JAW3 or JAW3S hashes from the folks over at uh, Salesforce. And commonly what defenders are doing is once they've got an anchor on attacker infrastructure, they start to pivot. So for example, if I have a known bad domain name, I can go look at what IP address that maps to and then go do a reverse IP lookup and see in turn what other domain names are hosted on that IP. That's not guaranteed, of course, to give you other bad uh, domains. It's very possible they're in a co-hosting environment, but it's one tactic. You know, there's to go from the domain name to the DNS server and see what other domain names that DNS server is authorized to answer questions for. You know, perhaps there's a pattern in the domain name and you can do a, a pivot on that. You look at the registrant, you can uh, brute force subdomains. You know, IPs can go to ASNs and you can pivot from there. You know, the bottom line is that the, from each one of these different anchors, whatever we're given, we can start mixing and matching and kind of expanding out our scope and knowledge of the infrastructure. Um, I had mentioned SSL certificates. You know, another common one that we're using is Google Analytics IDs. <laughs> you know, funny enough, uh, you know, malware campaign uh, authors want to track their, uh, their campaigns and they'll use things like, like Google Analytics. And so if they're gonna go ahead and put that anchor in there, why not you know, leverage it to you know, enumerate the rest of their, um, their infrastructure as well? You know, if you're curious on doing some you know, free open uh, pivots, uh, and these slides will be posted, don't worry about copy pasting and whatnot, um, here are some places you can do that, some tooling uh, that's, that's open and can be used uh, for pivoting and enriching IP addresses. Um, later, we'll also talk about uh, Inquest Labs. It's an open data research portal. Um, you can get some IP and domain name pivots from there as well. 
You know, the other kind of pivoting that we can do, and this is something that is more uh, in tune with my um, you know, daily research and, and uh, interests, is we can pivot on the file itself as well. Um, and one of the first things that we do when we're, when we're processing files is we, we extrude them, right? You know, very, very common that uh, these malware carriers are encapsulated. So take that flash uh, zero day, for example. If that flash zero day was inside of a Word document, that Word document was zipped, that thing was emailed off. So you need to go four layers deep to go see, I think it was digital rights management um, action script was, was the zero day there. You got to unravel all these layers to get to that, that component, that, that core component of it. Um, so that's the, one of the first things we do. You know, we take these, these document carriers and we explode them. We take out uh, metadata, we take out uh, embedded uh, content. It, you know, we recursively descend into those as well. Um, we'll extract uh, embedded logic. We'll do some normalization on it. We'll do some decoding if we find you know, common encoders or, or a common like string obfuscation. Uh, we'll also pull out the semantic layer. You know, what's in the layers, what's in the document? What's in the cells of the spreadsheet? If there's an image embedded in there, you know, is there any text in there? Well, what does that say? Pull that out. What's the metadata on the images? You know, every single object that is embedded in this thing has to be taken out and strewn across the table for analysis. This is all static. Um, you know, the next thing we can do once we have this all uh, thrown out on the table is we start looking for IOCs, for example, uh, IP addresses, domains, and URLs. Uh, you know, there's other things, like for example, like Adobe XMP IDs is something I'll cover in a second. Uh, you know, perhaps we, we pivot on our own alert labels or AV labels, right? There might be some commonality between samples. Um, perhaps the graphical lore is reused in multiple places and visually we can see that although these 10 samples have, you know, completely different uh, hashes, they are clearly the same based on the fact that the image lore is the same. You know, as an example from a 50,000 foot view of what this might look like, um, you know, this obviously you're not going to discern anything from here other than the concept of the scale of what this kind of pivoting can do. Because if you mix the two, file pivots and infrastructure pivots, now suddenly if I have a file that references an IP address that maybe resolves to, you know, another domain that had another uh, sample uh, that spoke to it, I can draw the connection between these and put them into the same cluster. You know, one of our, our goals here is if we can collate everything together, then we can focus on the outliers. But until we're doing that, we're just looking at a huge mound of data. Uh, so this pivoting is, is something we do uh, manually that allows us to draw relationships and you know, extrude entire collections of samples um, out of this mound of data, right? We're, we're trying to do the quickest thing we can to plow through and find the interesting uh, stuff. So I mentioned you know, pivoting on XMP IDs. I, I want to dive into this one a little bit more just because it's something that's uh, fairly uh, underutilized, we'd say. You know, there's, there's image-based like perception hashing you can do, like A hash, P hash, W hash, D hash on, on images, but you know, that's slow. Uh, of course, this, um, the cryptographic hashes, one pixel change, it's suddenly a completely different, um, you know, it's a completely different uh, hash on the other end. Right, so these, Adobe has this concept of extensible metadata platform. You know, really what it is, is um, either uh, GUIDs or uh, hash values that are designed to track parent to child uh, relationship and revision tracking. So you have like the original ID, the current document ID, and the instance ID. And what's key is that these IDs are stored within the asset themselves and they're updated within the asset as soon as you know, the user hits save. How this visualizes, we'll have three different documents here. I got the, the, the blue line, the pink line, and the red line. The original uh, is the blue on the top left. We made a copy of it to get to the, the, the pink column. We made another copy of it to get to uh, the red column. Every time we save it, you'll see a new instance ID. Um, and so what this allows us to do is pivot potentially on images that have left this embedded in there really, really rapidly. Um, you know, to date, I think we're tracking something like around 2,500 different um, XMP IDs. Uh, as we see them come out, it's a very, very low cost way for us to just suddenly put an, a, a pin on that entire campaign for every single new uh, lure carrier that they make. Ooh, the formatting there did not come out uh, correct. So, you know, now that we've covered kind of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the thought process, what's working for attackers, what defenders are doing, and the, and the, the, the stated problem is how do we go through this data? And the question, of course, comes, well, what, what is your data? You know, in our case, 
Uh, my primary research uh, is looking at, at carrier documents as they're strewn across uh, DOD environments, right? The primary customer base for us is in the federal sector, and I'm very tuned in on their specific kinds of problems. You know, a lot of uh, enterprise customers in the more uh, uh, mature side of the SOC environment, they'll also be looking at things, you know, at this level. You know, I'd love to hear about uh, other, like, file-related situations in folks' enterprise environments. So please ping me on the chat. Um, and I also left uh, contact information there for, you know, email, Twitter, and all that as well. I'd love to hear about people's you know, specific problems. But for the data set that we, you know, can all publicly work on together, uh, we look at a virus total intelligence, right? This is uh, uh, Google's uh, purchased uh, company from many years ago, uh, very heavily used by most offenders. Um, <clears throat> you know, people uh, purchase virus total intelligence to consume it on the back end, and then it's just an open system for folks to upload files from uh, all over the world. And what we're looking at is uh, a very recent statistics with regards to what the daily uploads of virus total look like. Forgive the formatting here, but you know that top line across is how many total files a day, followed by how many of those are distinct, so you know non duplicates, followed by how many of them are, are distinct and new? So it's the first time they've ever been seen, you know, never been seen before, followed by how many of them have at least one AV detection. And you know, virus total's got something like 60, 70 engines now. So numerically, we're looking at um, you know, every single day, there's about 400,000 at least potential uh, malicious files that are coming into uh, virus total. Um, someone asked on the channel about using Cuckoo to help speed up uh, analytics. Absolutely but you're not gonna cuckoo you know, 2 million samples a day. It's just impossible to do that. One of our goals for, for wading through the noise for, um, for clustering things, for example, is you know, then maybe we can go sandbox one sample as opposed to 1,000 and pass judgment on that whole 1,000. So dynamic analysis, you know, 100% is, uh, you know, there is certainly no, um, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, the, the cost of, of, uh, of of, of sandboxing at that level. I'm just laughing about a comment in the channel. Uh, it is, <clears throat> it is um, a high barrier, high bar to, to jump. So <clears throat> that's one of the, uh, the, the uh, it's certainly one of the tools, right? There's no silver bullet. You, know, you throw everything in the kitchen sink at the problem of, of discovering a, a badness. So if we look at the file distribution, you know, no surprise, number one file type is executable. Uh, but we are interested in those non-executables. The biggest one is PDFs. Um, that's about a, a million. Um, uh, we look at uh, Office documents, like 50,000. It goes down from there. So, you know, fairly uh, a big amount of data to, to deal with. So first things first, you know, what do you do with reducing the volume? Like, I'm not going to look at all these samples every single day. You know, we've published uh, a set of YAR rules, our hunt rules, that reduce that set down into what ends up being about 5,000 samples a day or less than 1% of the total daily corpus. And you can see some of the stats on the right-hand side. Uh, those rule names all map to some open source hunt rule that we have published on that, on that repository. All right, so what we're looking for is all these different layered uh, carriers. And that graph across the bottom, uh, color-wise, it'll match the legend above. The peak of that is at about 5,000. I know it's hard to read. So you can kind of see how it goes um, uh, over time. Uh, we've built a system for ingesting all these things. Uh, I, I won't spend too much time on this eye chart, uh, but the system is now open for folks to, to play with. Um, and we'll cover some of that in a second. So, you know, now that we've reduced the overall set from, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand, a couple hundred thousand uh, samples a day to a couple thousand samples a day, you know, how do we take it down one level further, right? If we're looking at things that have very low or no, no uh, labels at all, no AV detection, no consensus across the AV community, you know, one of the things I like to look for that provides value is evasions that would not be done or not happen through any kind of like you know, point and click um, uh, interaction. You know, it's somebody has gone into the file and they've done some editing, some manipulation of it. You know, while of course there will be some false positives here, the, the vast majority of them will fall more towards the something is suspect about its side. You know, some examples of that are uh, MIME evasions, right? Like RTF files, for example, the, the Windows built-in rich text format. The MIME magic says that it must start with RTF1, but that's not the reality. It can just start off with uh, uh, open squiggly bracket back whack uh, RT. You know, the Microsoft parsers are notorious uh, for being very flexible. 
if you look at, um, there was a tiny PE challenge once where, you know, folks were making this, how could, the challenge was the small, can you, what is the smallest possible executable file you can make in Windows that will actually run? And it was a fun challenge, you know, folks were kind of passing it back and forth between one another. Um, and it's quite amazing at how much they're able to bend that file and still have the Microsoft parser uh, handle it just fine. You know, another example is PDF magic, not being at zero. You know, that can float anywhere in the first 1K of the file. And that gives you the opportunity to even do things like mime trickery. You know, perhaps I put something that starts with a zip magic, has a PDF extension. Uh, the PDF header is, you know, somewhere in the first 1K. And then the defensive stack thinks it's a zip file, tries to unzip it, fails. You know, this hybrid file then gets over to the end user. They open it up and, you know, whatever my PDF payload was will, will go to them. You know, another way that you can, uh, and when I say burning your wares, I'm talking about from the perspective of the attacker, right? These are things that I would never do if I were making my own malware campaign. You know, another really silly one is you'll see, because we'll do things like, you know, we're extracting um, you know, macros from documents, action script from Flash, JavaScript from PDF, and decompiling Java from uh, the Java applets. Sometimes the attackers are very friendly and just burning, um, you know, burning their campaigns by leaving symbols in their, in their code. Things like shell code, exploit, you know, heap spray. If we see one of these, that's immediately going to be an, an eye catcher. Uh, another example would be a UTF-8 byte order marker, right? Like you can start this at the very start of a file and for a bunch of different security tools, you might break their mind detection. And this is a technique going back to uh, 2013. Um, another one, you know, we call it chaff. This is just like wasted, you know, like husk, just unused things. And visually, here is an example. Uh, what I've done here, this is an XML file. Uh, it's from a, a Microsoft Office, uh, uh, you know, the double O XML format. So, uh, you know, the zip file with the XML inside of it. And this is an exploit for um, what's known as the, the Microsoft DDE uh, uh, vulnerability. This thing was great when it first came out. I mean, I could literally teach an audience how to exploit this vulnerability with like nine seconds and three clicks right from within a document. It's just a straight up uh, command execution um, from, from a Word document. And so, uh, you know, very, very quickly, as we started seeing folks evolving on the, on the tactic, you know, this is a real world example that came out and there's a great uh, example of chaff. I've written a very, very tiny regular expression there that is highlighting and therefore it's highlighting all the chaff and therefore what's not highlighted and stands out is the actual payload. You know, what we're looking for here is that's the regex, we're just looking for all the XML tags. And then we can see the individual components. Here's this DDD, DD auto. It's pivoting to command.exe, and then you know from there going to whatever the next um, um, either PowerShell or, or you know pulling down some uh, next stage payload. All right, so this is a great example of um, they use this tactic to try and bypass detections, but just the fact that they're even using this tactic allows us to de to detect that something nefarious is going on. It's odd for there to be this kind of just junk data in there. So by looking for chaff, by looking for purposeful junk data, you know, superfluous bytes, we're able to find, potentially find something that someone's trying to hide, right? And, it, and that, as an, from an attacker's perspective, that's just a foolish thing to be doing. You don't want someone to see a shiny box. You just want to be a needle in the haystack. But again, if they're going to make that mistake, why not uh, leverage it to, to you know, detect that, um, uh, that campaign? You know, a, a more nefarious uh, um, obfuscation type um, is, I call it the RTF bite nibble. This was discovered by Kaspersky researchers in like a, like a February or something of 2018. And then later that year, a couple months later, that same technique was used by a zero day in the wild campaign. So 2018, 8174 was a zero day in the wild that if you had read Kaspersky's research on this bite nibble uh, evasion, and written a detection for it, this zero day would have just fallen into your lap when these folks used it. You know, and how it works, they essentially found uh, very, very neat, uh, I recommend checking out the paper. They found a flaw in the state machine that allows them to specify a byte sequence that ends up nibbling uh, 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 some data after it. So here again, I'm using a regular expression to show the before and after. What's highlighted is the junk bytes and what remains is the actual uh, uh, content once the RTF parser, uh, you know, goes to work. You can see that this uh, OBS, OBS data with this 0105, you know, I see that I'm like, all right, there we go. We have an embedded, uh, um, some embedded content there. But with the, on the left-hand side, 
with the chaff in there, if you are looking at things from a static string perspective, um, you know, you're gonna miss that. Where are we? All right, so you know, these are all the manual things. Um, you know, what, how can we now take this to the next level with uh, automation, right? We have, we've taken a big corpus of data where we've gotten it from, we've narrowed it down, we've narrowed it down, and now we want to essentially find the individual clusters, the, the samples that are nothing more than, than it instances or, or individual instances of the same core campaign. And we want to get those off the table and get them out of the way, right? This is the, the cosmic microwave background radiation of uh, just the, all the campaigns that are going on uh, you know, globally. If, if as defenders, we lean so heavily on you know, IOC exchange between everybody, then you want to find the IOCs that are specific to you and your environment, not just the ones that are, are um, uh, problems for everybody. Um, on the, so, you know, on the, on the ML side, what it comes down to is you've got your data, hopefully labeled data, and you need to choose your features that come out of that. Um, and from there you can, uh, you choose and pick algorithms to work on top of it. You know, that's the, the fundamental 50,000 foot view, right? And so the models I find are primarily driven by the features that you select, right? And this is really sitting down with a, a, a researcher who's been doing this and trying to get the way that they think written down into a city series of however many features, right? In our case, we have about 150 uh, features that we extract from uh, these document car carriers. And the way that we split them, or at least the way I visually think about this, it's about a 75%, 25% split between uh, what is a, a visual feature. So think about like when you just glance at a piece of code and in an instance, you know that it is uh, malicious just because it looks heavily obfuscated from the structure of it itself. You know, again, this is foolish to do this because you want to, ideally you want to hide your uh, payload in, in a large haystack of just normal looking data. But again, why not uh, leverage this capability to, um, uh, to identify the malware? Plus the way they do the obfuscation is going to essentially allow you to cluster these things together as the same, uh, um, type of campaign. So think about things like, uh, you know, the average length of the line, the number of defined functions, the number of defined variables, uh, things like um, the gibberish, we have a, a, a gibberish detector for a variable name, like how many variable names look like they're gibberish. You just start sitting down and writing these things all down and, if, you know, at some point you end up with a nice long list of, of features. Now on the tunable side, once you've picked and chosen uh, the correct algorithms, while the tunables take some, you know, more art than there is science, you know, they can quote unquote be fuzzed as well. You know, in this day and age of, of cloud compute, you know, when in doubt, you can just brute force it and find what set of parameters, what set of tunables, uh, you know, work best for, um, you know, that specific um, uh, uh, campaign or whatnot. So, you know, going to talk about a couple of different things here. All right. Uh, um, give me one second. Missing a slide. Hmm. So let's talk about a bag of words or, or bow and uh, what's known as term frequency inverse document frequency, right? If we're talking about the semantic layer, so when I'm looking at features uh, of like a macro, for example, uh, visually, I can write all those feature extractors, like, you know, count the number of lines, count X, count Y. If you want to just be generic and just take the actual like words of the macro itself, you know, what a bag of words is essentially you take that sheet of code and you just pick it up. And so all the different unique words are just jumbled together in one big bag. Here's your, your bag of words. Each sample, you know, can be seen as one bag of words. And then per sample, if you find terms that are essentially unique to a document versus the corpus of documents, those become interesting anchors. You know, we use this tactic sometimes to find uh, uh, unique strings to help in, in signature uh, generation. Uh, but you can also use it just to, to cluster things together as well. So just quick uh, background on, on bag of words and, and TFIDF, right? So now we've got our inputs. We've got a raw macro, which we will convert to a bag of words and then uh, uh, process with TFIDF. And then we also have our feature vector. So we have two that was extracted from the macro itself. And then from there, we have different ways of doing clustering. You know, one is looking at the macro itself and uh, using fuzzy hashes like SSD and TLSH. Uh, you know, another is to use a, a machine learning clustering algorithm, probably the most popular of its kind, uh, k-means. And that can be done on top of both data sets. So we can run it on, we can, we can cluster our samples using the bag of words as an input. We can also use it, uh, our features, and we can compare and contrast. 
You know, finally, and I have them on the same line because fundamentally they are the same uh, a general approach, is DB scanner or optics. And again, this can take either type of input, either your bag of words um, or, or your features. Uh, I am very much a visual person, and so I like to, to uh, <clears throat> I'll quickly run through like what these look like, the, the two fundamentally different approaches for the ML uh, pieces. First, on the fuzzy hash side, you know, what, we're look, what is a fuzzy hash? Uh, you know, technically, it's a context-triggered piecewise hash, CTPH, right? SSD is the most uh, ubiquitous option. It's actually SQL queryable, which is really rad. I mean, you can write a SQL query literally to tell you, show me all the samples in uh, uh, the data store that are within this distance of mine. Uh, you know, that was very cool research. I'm drawing a blank on the name of the guy who pulled that off, uh, but someone I, I'll put in the channel after the fact. You know, a newer uh, option is TLSH. So this is a, uh, a essentially a min hash implementation from the Trend Micro guys. It's a newer option. It's gaining traction. It was recently included in Stix uh, 2.1, and it appears to have uh, some more vibrancy uh, behind it. So certainly worth keeping an eye on. Uh, and why not try both? In both of these cases, the input's going to be raw macros, and we're going to have to choose some threshold for what do we consider um, Underneath this threshold, it's going to be part of the same family, and we can put this, uh, both of these algorithms to, uh, you know, to run and create our clusters. So here, you have to choose, what is my threshold for clustering? That's a tunable. On k-means, the general approach, the idea is, you are making an assumption on the number of clusters that there might be, which is a pretty big ask when you're dealing with this problem, obviously. This is why we're doing multiple uh, approaches. And again, you could somewhat fuzz this. You can run this multiple times, um, you know, grid search with different inputs uh, and see how the outputs come out. But generally what you're doing is uh, you're randomly choosing some points. You start uh, measuring the distance between that dummy point and all other points, and then you move to the next denser area. You keep doing this until you're no longer making improvements. And so visually, we can see this as, this is three clusters here. That was you know, pre-chosen. And as it moves, you can see that it starts to resonate on, um, uh, you know, this is 14 iterations in, and it's, it's finally found its three independent uh, clusters. You know, the other way of going about it, uh, and again, we'll see this in a second visually, it's a totally different method, is, is this DB scanner or optics. Uh, the major difference between them is how it's going to handle your data. Uh, DB scan is better suited for uniform density data. Uh, optics is better suited for varying density uh, data. And you'll see where this is going to make a difference in a second. Uh, here, your choices are two. You have to choose what's known as the epsilon value, and you have to choose what your min points threshold is. You know, fundamentally, the idea here is we're going to choose a point. We're going to go an epsilon distance out. And if there's enough points in there that suffices the min point, then that suddenly becomes a core point. Otherwise, it's an edge point, and points without any neighbors are just noise. You know, they're going to fall off the side. Uh, so again, visually, we can see it goes, you know, one, two, three, four. Instead of choosing clusters and migrating them, this one is more of a start somewhere and kind of like infect out. Like you can kind of see it spreading. So here we've got a blue dot, and it starts to, to find its cluster. Uh, later on, you see a green comes onto the scene, and then a red, and then so on and so forth until it has gone through and identified all your different uh, clusters. You know, looking at the results, and so this is still a, a work in progress. Um, we will open source uh, the, this entire corpus, you know, which is, consists of 10,000 unique recent uh, carriers, uh, both benign and malicious. Um, it's about 20% of them are, are labeled. Uh, by the time we get it out um, to the field and you know, to the open, it'll be a lot more than that. But using these tactics, just com to compare them between each one, the idea is let's go cluster on using each algorithm. Let's take our data corpus and let's cluster them. If a cluster is labeled very heavily towards malicious, then perhaps all the samples there are malicious. And conversely, if they are benign, then perhaps all the samples in that uh, cluster are benign. And so if we look at the potential uh, label contribution that this kind of expansion gives us, and of course the accuracy is still uh, in question, for example, SSD for sure is gonna have some uh, false positives up there with that, that massive uh, um, ad. Um, but each one, one of the most interesting things about this is that there's not that much overlap, right? So the, the combination of them all adds up, any individual one goes up to a max you see of 10%, but all of them together actually go up to almost 20 points in additional uh, labeling that, that's plausible come out of it. 
So, you know, what's left once you do all this? Will you discard the clusters, right? And so what is remaining is going to be the things that you're going to be looking at through dynamic analysis, you know, throwing it on your sandboxes, uh, especially if you're going to be doing it on, on bare metal, if you're looking for uh, uh, samples that are going to try and be sandbox aware and perhaps use some tactic that, uh, you know, bypasses the anti-anti sandbox detection. Um, you know, manual analysis, you know, perhaps focusing on the things that are deemed potentially suspect, uh, uh, but, you know, undetected. So there's not, you know, it's not pulling up any uh, uh, AV labels, not triggering any alerts. You know, other things you can do once you've, once you've gotten to this layer is go back to manual. So now what's left, I might start going through them and find unique constants or assets, metadata, uh, if we have access to how we got that file in the first place, perhaps we can find some commonalities in the network headers to further tune and cluster what's remaining. Uh, again, with the overall goal being, we started off with a million, we want to get down to, you know, per analyst, maybe a dozen a day of samples to, uh, to look at. Um, you know, just as an example, uh, one of our most commonly a very successful uh, uh, finding new malware campaigns is it's non exploit based ones. You have to convince the user, coerce the user through some social engineering to enable your active content. So by pulling all these uh, image uh, assets out of carriers, running them through optical character recognition and looking for that, you know, coercive um, uh, uh, vernacular, you know, we're able to start finding very interesting uh, low volume uh, detection, but uh, unique samples. And here's just an example of, you know, the past couple weeks worth of uh, images that we've pulled out of that harvest. Um, I know I'm running out of time, but just want to leave you guys with um, uh, labs.inquest.net is where we're pushing all these things out. You know, there's uh, samples that you can search through, has an open API. Uh, there's IOC aggregation from various, uh, uh, sources that we follow. Uh, we do reputation aggregation as well. And so, you know, these are all the data sets that we've had to put together uh, to get all this to, to work. And so we've tried to open up as much of it as plausible for um, you know, our peers to, to be able to uh, research as well. Um, and that's it. I'm going to open up to um, any questions from there. And please feel free to get in touch. That was awesome. I knew it was uh, worth keeping up on you to uh, bug you to do a talk. So <laughs> It's a great presentation. I do, there, we're going into a break now, but there was one question that someone DM'd me. They didn't want to post it for whatever reason. They didn't want attribution, but they say, uh, given your background in research, do you find that applications like Microsoft Office Suite and browsers are riddled with bugs due to using low level languages? Where do you see malware and exploitation going after safer languages are used like Rust and is Rust going to unhack the planet? <laughs> Um, I mean, we'll see adoption. There's been many new languages that have come out over the decades, yet most uh, enterprise software is still written in things that we are you know, familiar with, these unsafe types. It's, the biggest difficulty is the, is the complexity of the code. I mean, just look at the attack surface, right? Microsoft Office, you know, from what I've seen, is like tens of millions of lines of code supporting decades of features and a super, super rich environment. Like your browser, for example, will be one of the last places for vulnerabilities to die. You've got mixed media, a scripting language, you know, all sorts of capabilities and attack surface that's not only rich, but constantly changing as well. So I think that the cat and mouse game will be on the client side for some time, especially when you look at, um, you know, outside of the, the safety of the language, there's also the anti-exploitation, uh, uh, um, just based technologies, like your ASLRs, your DEPs, your, your safe SEH, et cetera. Uh, you really need access to a more rich environment to make exploitation easier. So I think that'll probably be client side will probably be the last place for vulnerabilities to die.